Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our third session on Dionysus Flow for, for What Source Rock Modeling. We are very happy to be with you today, so thank you for participating and registering, and we hope you'll find the meeting useful. So let me introduce your speakers today. Your main speaker will be Samer Boudaer. Samer uh, holds a PhD in geochemistry. He's been working with Dionysus Flow for many years in the academic world first, and he has joined us last year. And the moderator of the event will be Alcide Thébault, who's been uh, working with us for ne nearly 10 years now. He's been also deeply involved in the development of Dionysus Flow as a product manager, and he also has a strong expertise on the subject. So you have here the two guys to uh, properly uh, introduce you this topic and uh, answer the questions you may have. A few guidelines before we start. As you probably noticed, you are all automatically muted. So if you have questions during the presentation, please use the question panel that is available at right hand side, and we will answer them during the Q&A breaks. Uh, however, don't necessarily wait for these breaks to write your questions down, otherwise we'll have a long list and it will be hard for us to uh, address all of them. Anyway, if we cannot address all of them live, we'll do that afterwards by email. You will also find at right hand side a polls panel in which we will ask you some questions from time to time, so if you can check it out, that would be great. And finally, the full video is recorded, uh, so we will put it on a neutral channel afterwards and I will now leave the stage to Samer, so um, I hope you will find this presentation useful. Enjoy. Thank you, Marie, and hello and welcome everyone to Bessifron Lab's second software webinar on the topic of uh, forward uh, source of modeling with Unisys Flow. Uh, what we have prepared to you today uh, includes four items on the agenda. Uh, the first is uh, a, uh, an introduction to the topic of organic matter uh, modeling of source of modeling. Uh, the second is a presentation of how we uh, incorporated those concepts into the Dionysus flow uh, tool for organic matter modeling, followed by a quick uh, QA session. And finally, a live demonstration of the organic matter modeling tool in Dionysus flow. And a final QA break. So let's start a little bit with, uh, with the concepts of organic matter modeling. Uh, but before we start, it's worth mentioning that this tool that we are going to present to you today is the result of several years of joint industry research uh, at EFP, uh, funded by major industry players such as Total, uh, Repsol, Chevron, and, uh, and others. Um, <clears throat> This tool uh, has been now fully integrated with Dionysus Flow and uh, is part of, uh, as, you, as you know, Dionysus Flow is our fourth serigraphic modeling solution. So we thought before we get into the organic matter part, we uh, should also um, introduce you to the topic of forward serigraphic modeling for those who, of you who are not familiar with it already. So as the name uh, suggests, forward serigraphic modeling is a forward approach that we use to simulate the filling of a sedimentary base basin forward in time or, or of an interval within a sedimentary basin. We start at a certain point in time and we move forward and at different time steps we have to specify some parameters such as accommodation space for example. So we need to tell the software how much space there is to be filled with sediments. Um, then we bring in the sediments and we could bring several types of sediments. These are uh, Plastic sediments, for example, that come with rivers, and they can be different types of plastic sediments. Uh, we can also then produce in situ sediments within the within the, the model, within the water column, and that's the carbonate sediments, the carbonate part that could be could be generated at different environments. And finally, the third part of uh, third type of sediments, which is the focus of this presentation, is the organic matter part, marine and terrestrial organic matter. Now, once we have um, the sediments in, we need to move them around. And the way we move sediments around in this approach is through uh, is by using our diffusion equation that accounts to, uh, for sediment movement uh, by mimicking uh, a lot of the coastal processes and, and sediment transport processes um, with gravity, wave, and, and water transport. And of course, um, this is a, a, a methodology that is at the end calibrated to observations. And these observations can be, this calibration data can be well data and seismic data, so the obvious and the usually used calibration data. 
and of course it could be uh, it could be compared and calibrated to to present day analogs or to outcrop data that is available the kind of results you would get out of uh, out of Unisus is uh, is actually a long list, but to summarize it in one in one uh, in one slide, uh, you'd have a four dimensional block that uh, gives you information on sediment distribution and proportions for your source rock reservoir and seal. So you'd get your petroleum system elements uh, characteristics uh, in thickness, quality, and quantity. Um, you will also get depositional environment properties such as bathymetry, water discharge, wave energy, um, and of course, for the for the, the focus of this talk is is the source rock. So you get uh, details on on the depositional environment in terms of oxygen, for example, at sediment water interface, hydrogen index, and so on. All that can be uh, with few clicks. Um, Transformed into a synthetic seismic that you get to, you can compare to your um, to your original seismic data. Now the fields of application of this um, of this methodology vary from frontier basins all the way into field scale, uh, and it's worth noting here that the, with with, the, with that variation in scales of application, also the objectives of application change as well. So at frontier and basin scale, the objectives would be delineation of reservoir uh, and seal and source rock distribution and quality, while in mature basins it becomes uh, subtle traps, geometry, subtle uh, stratigraphic traps. In field scales, it would be improved history matching and, and uh, production mitigation issues. For um, the soft, for, for the, the the source rock tool and the software, we are more at the basin scale rather than the, than the field scale. So it's a, it's a basin scale application for the organic matter uh, tool in the Unisys flow. Now back to the to the organic talk, since now we have introduced the, the, the general topic of uh, forward stereographic modeling, we can focus on the organic part. Um, so the, the presence or the absence of a um, petroleum source rock depends on the efficiency of the organic factory. And you can think, think about the organic factory as having three main parts or three main departments. And these are the organic matter production, the organic matter transport, and the organic matter preservation. And it is um, the interaction between those three parts um, that controls whether we will or we will not have a source rock and the distribution and types and quality of the source rock if it was if it would be deposited so starting with the organic matter production uh, and here we're talking marine organic matter so marine organic matter production happens in the photic zone and it is largely controlled by the availability of nutrients so the nutrient supply method would would then um, control where is the primary productivity happening in the photic zone um, one end member of nutrient supply, one type of nutrient supply, would be through upwelling systems, such as is illustrated here in this schematic. So you'd have deep uh, deep sea currents that would um, reach the surface, that would upwell to the surface along along the shelves, and bring with it uh, oxygen-rich and nutrient-rich waters from the deep sea, and will induce uh, primary productivity in the photic zone in those areas. The other end member, the other um, possibility is to have nutrients supplied by uh, from the land by weathering and erosion of the hinterland. And that will induce also primary productivity in the photic zone. And both uh, could be present in the same place at the same time, but could also function separately uh, to a certain extent. And they would result in uh, as some differences in the source rock properties and the source rock distribution that, that will end up uh, being deposited. Now, in terms of transport, we have two types of transport that we need to account for, the vertical transport and the lateral transport. So for the vertical transport, we use uh, Martin's, exponent, Martin's law to calculate the flux of organic uh, carbon into the seafloor from the, from the photic zone. And for the lateral transport, we use our diffusion equation and we transport the organic particles the same way as we transport other, uh, other sediments in the system. Now, once this, the, the, the organic matter reaches the 
the sea floor. Um, we have to calculate a burial efficiency to know how much of it we actually end up saving in, in a source rock or, or preserving in a source rock. And that preservation depends on two factors, and these are sedimentation rate, so how fast do we, do we hide it from being degraded, and uh, redox conditions at the sediment water interface. So that means um, how long can it stay at the sediment water interface at the seafloor without it being degraded, without the organic matter being degraded. So therefore, the burial efficiency is dependent, so the curve at which the burial efficiency will, will follow um, depends on the oxic or anoxic conditions. So for anoxic conditions, it will follow something like this. At oxic conditions, it will be uh, quite low at low sedimentation rates. So basically, our, our tool will, will, will uh, during the run, will calculate the oxygen uh, at, the, at the bottom water and will decide if the, if the depletion environment is anoxic then we will follow a, a burial efficiency curve that is in this red area over here. If we are in disoxic conditions, then we will follow a burial uh, efficiency curve that is somewhere over here. And if we are on, in, in oxic environments, then we will have very low burial efficiencies at low sedimentation rates. Note that at high sedimentation rates, it doesn't matter anymore what is the oxygen conditions because the organic matter is being buried really fast anyway. So there is no time for it to be degraded at the bottom waters. Now we have talked about the, the, the principles and the, the, the theory behind. Let's uh, have a look a little bit at how do we uh, incorporate this theory and translate it into applications, into, uh, into tools for the user to put it in, in the Unisys uh, flow. So the, the, the Unisys flow organic matter tool is a fully integrated tool within the Unisys flow. Um, so basically, in one run, you'd get your, your reservoir, your seal, and your source rock. So it's a fully uh, integrated uh, methodology, and it's a streamlined and versatile tool where, where, where the user is, is able to, uh, to model different kind of environments, different kind of depositional systems for marine organic matter, such as we said earlier, nutrients coming from upwelling system or nutrients coming from the marine systems. But you could also bring in terrestrial organic matter, which we will see an example of a little bit later. And we have the ability to, um, to have different preservation configurations. For example, we can model a restricted basin, such as present-day Black Sea. But we could also model an oxygen minimum zone that is usually the case on open marine shelves with, with upwelling systems, such as offshore Peru present-day or offshore Namibia, where you'd have a band of, of, uh, of anoxia along the shelf that has really good social quality. Um, and we have the ability to change in the same model from a, ba from a restricted basin into an open marine and vice versa. And at the end, the kind of results that you would get is a wide range of output uh, parameters that you could calibrate directly, but also indirectly to your geochemical data from your source rock. Now let's go into how do we uh, input primary production uh, in the Unisys flow. So let's uh, first start with the upwelling uh, system to the left. So if I want to model an upwelling, um, a situation where I have an upwelling system, I need to select that option. And in that option, I have to input uh, a, a value for primary production in the photic zone. And that value would be produced in, um, in the photic zone above water depth of 200 meters, in this case, 200 meters plus or minus 100. So that means in that range of bathymetry, my upwelling current coming from the deep sea bringing nutrients will reach the photic zone and will induce a primary productivity that is equal to this value. For the river nutrient source, um, you have a, a simpler story. There you have primary production uh, that is highest closest to the shore and it decreases with distance to shore. So here you see that at zero distance to shore, you have a value that is user defined that decreases linearly away from the shore also to a value and to a distance that is user defined. To better illustrate this for you, we made this schematic. So again, to the left for the upwelling system, you have um, 
here a certain bathymetry that is, let's say this is 200 uh, plus or minus 100, so from 100 to 300. And we specified that above that, we will have the primary production in the photic zone. So that's the curve of primary production that we will have above that bathymetry, mimicking an upwelling system, an upwelling current that comes from the deep sea and reaching the photic zone above this bathymetry along the shelf. For the riverine nutrient uh, source, again, it's much simpler. You start with a PP with the primary production that is highest at the shore and you decrease linearly depending on the user defined values. To show you how does that affect the social distribution uh, in a simple way, here we have uh, model two synthetic examples that show the difference. So to the right, you have the example of primary production decreasing with distance to shore. So here we have the shore and we have the highest primary production around here and away from it towards the offshore, we get less and less. And you see here that the distribution of source rock is more spread along this synthetic uh, shelf and slope. And towards the offshore, it disappears completely because here we chose an open marine setting. So we have plenty of oxygen in this area and not much primary productivity. Um, while to the left, we have this band of really rich source rock, and that is because here we have an upwelling system that resulted in the formation of this oxygen minimum zone, above which we will not have a source rock, and we have very oxic environment, and below which we will also not have a source rock, and we will have also a lot of oxygen. Um, so, of course, these, these are two synthetic examples that, that show this in, in, in a very simple way without much sediment movements, but this is just to illustrate the, the idea in a, in a synthetic model. Um, now, here a little bit about the preservation configuration. So, uh, we still have the same model to the right. So, the model where we have primary production uh, decreasing from, from the coast, from the shore towards the offshore. Uh, with open marine system in the deep in the deep sea, and that's how our oxygen configuration for this model looks like. So here you have the mixed layer, the the photic zone, where uh, all the primary production is happening and all the mixing of oxygen from the atmosphere. And um, from the bottom of that layer, you start uh, decreasing in oxygen. So the oxygen is getting consumed and not replenished until you reach a certain depth where it gets to a minimum, and then in this configuration where we chose an open marine system, we have a replenishment of seafloor oxygen at bottom, uh, at, at deep waters. And that's the result, that, that results in this lack of TOC in this situation over here because, because all of the primary production that manages to, to reach the seafloor here is getting oxidized and never preserved. In this situation to the left, you have the same exact model with primary productivity decreasing from distance with distance to shore, but with a completely restricted uh, situation. So here we have again the, the mixed layer. We start decreasing from the bottom of the of the mixed layer and oxygen in the seafloor in this in the seafloor. Then you reach a point where you have consumed all the oxygen and there is no absolutely here we killed any um, bottom currents that will bring any uh, seafloor oxygen to the system. So they will become completely anoxic. And that is what you see here. The, the reason why you see some TOC in the deep sea over here, even though it's not the highest, but there's still some TOC here. Um, but notice yeah, that, that the highest TOC is this band that is not the deepest part of the basin. And the reason for that is that it is in this area around here where both preservation and primary production are ideal for social deposition. That means that if you go above this, you have better primary production conditions because you're closest to shore, but you have very bad oxygen conditions for preservation. You're still in, in relatively oxic conditions. So you don't have very high TOC. Going deeper below that, band here, you have excellent preservation conditions. You have no oxygen at all, but you have uh, very little primary production. So that band in here is that uh, Goldilocks zone uh, where, um, where you have the best of both, of both worlds, basically. Um, so basically, the source rock that will be above this band and below this band will have very different character and will have very different hydrogen index, actually. 
Now we've talked a lot about um, marine organic matter. Let's talk a little bit about terrestrial organic matter. Um, so here's an example of how do we account for terrestrial organic matter and uh, the kind of parameters that we, uh, well, the way, the way we deal with it is by um, bringing it into the system as if it is a terrestrial particle, as if it is a clastic sediment. Um, so here's an example of a model with several clastic uh, entry points, several sediment supply uh, entry points. We chose this source here to bring in terrestrial organic matter with it in a percentage that is user defined. And here you look at a model with the bulk TOC that seems to be very high in those areas here. But if you look at the hydrogen index, then you see that, well, it's not, uh, it's not that uh, exciting. The areas that had high TOC were not that exciting in terms of uh, hydrogen index and therefore in terms of hydrocarbon generation. Um, and here's to, to, to emphasize that the ability of being able to, to, uh, to analyze and to divide marine from terrestrial source rock in those kind of models is very interesting, especially if you're working in an area where the source rock presence is the key in, in, in exploration, is the missing link, is the thing you're not sure about. Um, so there you can in detail dissect different, different uh, intervals and, and and be able to assess whether there is some hydrocarbon potential in a marine source rock or not. An example of, of where doing that subdivision is very useful is the Blolanger Formation offshore mid-Norway, where we have about a thousand meters that has very low hydrogen index, but it does have, in fact, a lot of excellent, uh, very well-preserved um, marine organic matter because it has been deposited under a and anoxic, under anoxic conditions in the Sinomanian Tyronean ocean anoxic event. Um, but it has been diluted by terrestrial organic matter. So you do not see the source rock potential when you take a sample and measure and measure it with rock eval and have a hydrogen index. But with an approach like this, you will have um, the possibility to divide terrestrial and marine and really have, have uh, the, the, the chance to to identify and to evaluate marine source rocks separately. And especially if you have the, the data to, uh, to calibrate that. So for example, if you have um, organic petrology results, so uh, vitrinite reflectance, uh, vitri sorry, vitrinite particles percentage, and liptinites and inertinites, then you can calibrate that model to those uh, percentages. Now, the kind of output that you might get out of, um, out of this tool is, uh, is of course, the, the typical Dionysus output, uh, which is sediment proportion. Uh, but among others, you could get also uh, primary productivity, TOC, and hydrogen index in bulk, but also per type of, set of, of organic matter. So you'd get your bulk TOC, your marine TOC, and terrestrial TOC, same for the hydrogen index. And these, you could then calibrate to your to your uh, geochemical data to your TOC and hydrogen index and thickness from your wells and um, one additional very important and very interesting uh, output is the oxygen concentration which is basically a proxy for oxygen concentration that we calculate but that you could calibrate indirectly or you could calibrate qualitatively to uh, any geochemical redox proxies you could have so for example if you have some biomarker data that is redox sensitive you could use that that will tell you well yes you had anoxic uh, conditions or no you didn't have anoxic conditions so you could kind of um, you could uh, validate and check the uh, your source rock model by using this kind of uh, redox sensitive data of course at the end the um, the main goal is to uh, learn as much as possible about the distribution and the type of source rock that we have and its carrying quality in order to take that information and inject it in petroleum system models for a better assessment of source rock, uh, of hydrocarbon generation potential. Now we have reached our first Q&A break, so I'll uh, give the floor to Alcid. So, yes, uh, we have two questions for the moment, so feel free to ask a bit more during that Q&A break if you want. Uh, the first question is, can we model any time span? For example, can we model the quaternary only? Uh, yes, of course, absolutely. Um, you you define the, the ages that you would like to model, and that's uh, that's a completely user uh, user entry. 
So actually, we were talking about the quaternary. Now let's go on the other span of the geological scale. So I am interested in Precambrian organic matter modeling. Do we have a different source rock kinetic for Precambrian? What are the assumptions we have for this type of organic matter? Uh, well, there you definitely will not use terrestrial organic matter. Uh, that's for sure. Um, but the type of um, of systems that um, that that uh, guide the the, the marine organic matter and the Precambrian are the same that guide um, the more or less the, the organic matter production in the photic zones now. So you would have, you would need an upwelling system or you would need nutrient supply from, from uh, erosion and weathering. So you could account for those and then uh, deposit your organic matter. So it's not really age dependent. Uh, it's of course, if you're in Precambrian, you cannot use terrestrial organic matter, but uh, but apart from that, uh, it's, uh, you can definitely apply it. Yes, and I just want to add that Dionysos just models the um, amount of organic matter and the preservation of organic matter. There is no direct yes. link with the source rock kinetic. This yes. is actually a separate aspect that is uh, an ongoing R&D at AFP where we will link the type of the organic matter, so type 1, type 2, type 3, to the actual kinetic. But uh, so there is not that distinction that is done directly in Dionysus at the time. Uh, okay, so a quick question on how do we model terrestrial and marine organic matter mixing? Um, well, the, the particle that we bring in in terms of terrestrial organic matter carries with it a hydrogen index that so far we are uh, taking it as a constant, as a user-defined constant that has usually a, a low hydrogen index. That is, that is uh, so, so, uh, so we define a low hydrogen index. And then it's just a dilution. So it dilutes the, 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 the marine hydrogen index and brings it down. Um, there is, um, if you're interested in more uh, details about the terrestrial organic matter, and you would like to, to get more information about future uh, capabilities of the software, we have uh, currently a research project with EFP that works on the, the second generation of this, Mary, of, of this organic matter tool that will include, include more capabilities related to the terrestrial part. Um, a new question, which is, is the organic matter degradation considered in the redox evolution of bottom waters, for example, the consumed oxygen of waters? Yes, so um, so we have two uh, steps of, of degradation. As you have, so you have first, you have exported the organic matter from the photic zone, and it, it entered that water column that will take it into its journey to the to the sea floor. So there, during that, there is the, that degradation that is that is guided that we calculate using Martin's law. Then, once it has reached the sediment water interface, there comes the burial efficiency calculation. So, um, so how much we're, 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 we're keeping for, uh, organic matter in, in the source rock, and there it's controlled by the sedimentation rate and the, um, and the redox conditions. And now there we are calculating not only how much we're keeping in, in terms of TMC, but also how much degradation in terms of hydrogen index. So how much we're losing source rock quality as well, not only quantity. So I will just take two questions and then we I think we will have to move to the next uh, mm -hmm. section so how precise are the results and are there any limitations uh, to the model um, yeah so uh, again this is as as we said in the in the first few slides this is a, a, a basin scale uh, approach um, so we tend to uh, to Kelly, uh, you will see an example of calibration later on. We tend to calibrate to trends, and it's uh, it's a complicated aspect of model organic of modeling organic matter deposition because there's a lot of parameters involved. So um, so we we tend to we keep it at basin scale, and we uh, we calibrate to trends basically. So we cannot tell you that you had exactly two percent TUC and. and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rule, it's a law, it's 100% calibration. But we can tell you that, yeah, well, most probably you're going to have your, let's say, uh, upper Cretaceous, you will have a very rich source rock that will have between this and this TUC and will have a good hydrogen index, for example. So these are, uh, 
yeah, these are the, the, the range of results you could get. And in terms of limitation, it's, uh, its limitation is that it does not in, include a, a paleo current model yet, but that will probably come in future generations of the software. So, and the second question, which actually will take care of two questions in one, how do you predict organic matter production? Uh, and how do you predict in more precisely upwelling? So the presence of upwelling. Yes, usually, so it's, it's important to make the, distingu the, the, the distinction that Unisus does not tell you where you have an upwelling. Unisus will tell you if you have an upwelling in this area, that's the source rock that you will have. So it's up then to, to the user to have a, uh, a paleogeographic understanding of the area that can tell you, well, yeah, my coastline was in the shape like this, that's according to the paleogeography, and my, my paleo latitude was like this. So if I take my, my trade winds and Ekman transport, then I'll probably have an upwelling in this area. Then you go to the Unisus, you'll be, okay, I want to have an upwelling in this area. What will my source shock be like? So that's, that's a, an important distinction that we need to, to make that the Unisus will not tell you where you will have primary production. The Unisus will, you, will, will give you the possibility of, if you have an idea where you might have primary production, you will be able to calculate where, you, where your source rock will be and what type of source rock you will have. Thank you, Samer. I think that yes. concludes the, the question session. So now you see my, um, my Dionysus flow uh, environment in the open flow um, platform. Here you have uh, the guidelines that will guide you through the steps of building a, a forward stratigraphic model. Uh, that is to the left here in the, my model building tab. To the right, you have my 3D viewer that has some results of a model that has been already built. Uh, here you have a model that is very mixed, so you have everything from uh, sand lobes to, to uh, reef to, to carbon and growth along, along the shelf here and, and here to then uh, draining the, uh, or drowning, drowning the platform and depositing some marine shale on top to hemipelagics to calcite so you have everything. Um, but what we're interested in, in here is the organic matter. So we also have here the organic matter component, terrestrial and marine. So let's look at the bulk DOC first. We see immediately that we have an interesting interval down here in the deep basin. And we have some organic matter deposition up here. And we have this shape that looks like a channel and a lobe over here that uh, so far we don't know whether it's terrestrial or marine but we could easily just click on marine organic matter and notice that it's it's not marine it's actually terrestrial now as i said this uh, let's go back to bulk and uh, this is a four-dimensional approach so let's look at uh, at this model in uh, in time how it's varying through time and here um we start at 100 million years and we simulate all the way to 50 million years. And we can see the, the start of source of deposition in the deep basin and how the system starts with gradually with increasing sea level and changing in subsidence. It starts to move away towards the slope first and then gradually it makes its way into um, into the, the, the shelf and eventually it, um, we reach a point where we move that system completely to the shelf area when we, when we drown that, that carbonate platform. So we have now we're building carbonate, we're building reefs and then once we start with this sea level high here, we start drowning that, that platform and depositing marine shales and here we move that source rock system, that marine source rock system towards towards the shelf area when we have ground the, um, the platform. So we have then our marine source rocks here. We can uh, identify that, well, on the shelf, it doesn't exist. It exists this, this very rich source rock only in the deep basin. And here's uh, an example of how this tool can be very useful. If you have a well on the shelf here, you will completely miss that excellent deep marine uh, 
source rock. And here I would like to mention that we have adapted this uh, uh, marine uh, organic matter model that has an upwelling system and an open marine setting. So let's look at the oxygen part of this. And we see that we have anoxia in the deep marine setting at the beginning when we, and then we start moving this anoxic conditions into the slope first and then eventually into the, the margin to the shelf when we have drowned the, um, the carbonate platform. So it's a very dynamic uh, way to, to, uh, to, to see the evolution of this, of, of the salt rock deposition. Um, with that, I will, uh, I will end my, uh, and of course, yeah, before I end it, I'll just need to mention that we're able to extract all sort of maps from this, so all properties that you have modeled. An example here is a map of hydrogen index, a map of TOC from that interval that is very rich in TOC that we've seen, and the thickness of your source rock, and all of this can go directly into your petroleum system um, models. Um, and with that, I, uh, I think uh, we're running a little bit out of time, so I'll, uh, I'll cut it here and I'll take some of your uh, final questions. So I'll see it, it's uh, yours, yours. So the first um, question, um, when you talk of upwellings, it is mostly in passive margins. What, uh, in, what about in rift basins? Uh, the thing is, uh, upwellings are not necessarily on, on, on rift margins. They have to have a certain direction with the wind and for the Coriolis effect and the Ekman transport to be active to remove that surface water away from the land and allow the bottom water to come to come in uh, for rift ba for for uh, for uh, rift basins then uh, you just have to in that case account for a more restricted setting so you would have to play with your uh, preservation configurations to mimic what is happening in a rift basin in terms of social modeling uh, new question. So, in the case of the area that paleogeographic evolution is not well understood, how useful is Dionysos flow in predicting contribution of organic matters from marine and terrestrial mm -hmm. sources? Well, uh, in that case, you're, uh, you can have fun by uh, doing some different scenarios. So, you can have a scenario where, okay, I'm going to assume an upwelling system. And I will run my uh, my simulations with that with that conceptual model. I can do Cougar on that, and then do sensitivity and uncertainty, and see how much would I vary in source shock. And then I can do the the, the, the other conceptual model where I have a uh, distance to shore setting and do also sensitivity and uncertainty on that. There's actually times where whatever you change, you will, there will be zones where you have always a source rock and zones where you never have source rock. So you can still get some information on, on that. Of course, there's systems that are more sensitive where a little bit of variation can give you a source rock or remove a source rock. But it depends, I would say, on your case. You might have a setting where whatever kind of primary productivity you will have, you will end up having a source rock or you will not. So uh, it's uh, something you need to test. And so before I, I ask you the final question, I just want to say that some polls have been put inside the polls panel. So please answer them before we conclude the, the meeting. And the final question is, is it possible to build a model in an area under compressive tectonics? What would be the required input data? <laughs> Um, compressive tectonics are a little bit uh, uh, tricky, so it uh, you're going to need to account for, for, for that tectonic activity through subsidence maps. So that is where you're, you, you will have to, 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 what you will have to play, to play around with. Extensional tectonics are much easier. If you have compressive tectonics where you still have marine conditions and still have uh, subsidence then you can yeah you can use subsidence maps to account for it and then the rest is the, the, the primary production and the source rock part is a little bit not related to that and then it's just a sedimentation rate thing and and primary production yes what i would add to that is that it depends really on when the, um, the compressive phase occurs if it occurs of after everything is deposited 
then actually it's you just need to reconstruct your base in order to understand what was the geometry before the deformation and that will actually drive your sedimentation your thicknesses and so on and what you need then is a reconstruction of the geometries before deformation and then you can just have a regular uh, sedimentation it would be the same as as as, as what samer showed uh, and then if the deformation occurs during the um, the sedimentation then it becomes uh, trickier um, and 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 that's is what samer was was saying Thank you very much uh, to all for attending this meeting. We hope you found it interesting. Looking at the polls, it looks like our next session will be on uh, carbonates because uh, this, uh, this is what got the most votes. Uh, thanks again. We wish you a good end of day and uh, we look forward to see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.